The F-35B is arguably the most advanced plane ever made, a jack-of-all-trades, a stealth fighter plane combining and improving on the capabilities of the F-16, of an 8B Harrier and B-2, a highly maneuverable fighter plane capable of attacking both airborne and ground-based targets, a stealth fighter taking the lessons learned from Lockheed's previous ventures into stealth with the F-22 Raptor and F-117 Nitro. A plane fitted with the most advanced sensors and computer systems, sharing information almost instantly with allies without compromising stealth and presenting the information directly on a heads-up display on the pilot's helmet visor, giving unparalleled situational awareness, allowing a flight of F-35s to effectively fight as a hive mind. Perhaps most boldly of all, the F-35B is capable of transitioning from horizontal to vertical flight with a push of a button using directional thrust and a massive vertical turbo engine hidden within the plane's body, making it possible to land like a helicopter on the relatively small amphibious assault ships of the U.S. Marines. Fitting all these capabilities into a single airframe is an extremely difficult task. Designing for stealth demands careful molding of the exterior of the plane, dictating the design of crucial features, creating unavoidable trade-offs. There are a lot of misconceptions about stealth. The goal isn't to make an aircraft invisible. It will be detectable. The goal is to delay enemy detection for as long as possible. For bomber aircraft, it shrinks the range of the enemy's radar stations, potentially opening gaps in radar defenses and allowing the aircraft to slip through undetected. For fighter aircraft, it provides a critical advantage. Detect your enemy before they detect you. To gain these advantages, we need to make it harder for the radar receiver to decipher whether the return signal is just background noise or an enemy aircraft. To do that, we need to minimize the strength of the return signal. There are several mechanisms for a radar wave to be reflected. The most significant and most obvious way is through specular return, otherwise known as regular reflection, like a mu. 1A, where the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence. We want to avoid large, flat surfaces that could reflect straight back to the radar receiver. Corner reflectors where two surfaces set at a 90-degree angle to each other need to be avoided at all costs. Tailplanes, consisting of the vertical and horizontal stabilizer, are the perfect surfaces to create a corner reflector, allowing radar to bounce off both surfaces and return right back in the direction it came. The best way to avoid this is to remove the tail completely, like the B2 with this impact's maneuverability greatly. Instead, we can replace both the horizontal and vertical stabilizer with a V-tail, as seen on the F-117 Nighthawk. The V-tail can act as both a rudder and an elevator, and we can see how by examining the resultant force generated when the control surfaces are actuated to different positions. We can actuate them in opposite directions to generate a horizontal resultant force, providing yaw control as a vertical rudder would, or we can deflect them in the same direction to provide pitch control as a horizontal elevator would. This configuration is sometimes used for unique-looking aircraft like the Cirrus 50, allowing it to mount a single tiny jet engine on top of the fuselage with its exhaust directed straight through the VTO. A private jet so tiny and lightweight that it can deploy a parachute to rescue itself in emergencies. Having rudder and elevator controls linked in a single mechanism like this is not ideal. Fighter jets like the F-35 and the F-22 need superior control authority, and that is a function of control surface area. The larger the elevator, the larger the elevator, the larger the pitch control. If a control surface is working a double roll, where rudder and elevator action is needed at the same time, it reduces the control authority. So, both planes also feature large elevators, offset by a distance and angled to prevent corner reflections. We can see many more trade-offs in design by comparing the F-117 and F-35 in the quest to fulfill both stealth and fighter requirements. Both the F-117 and B-2 have their engine air intakes mounted on the upper surface of the plane, which prevents ground-based radar from bouncing around inside the intake and back to the receiver, and helps reduce infrared heat signatures. However, for a plane expected to make high angle of attack maneuvers in life and death situations, this isn't a design you would want to include while performing a maneuver like this. The air intake will receive lower pressure air, which will lower performance right when performances need most. Air intakes located underneath the aircraft, like the F-16, will cause too much radar return, so twin intakes located on either side of the fuselage are instead chosen. The air intake has some clever aerodynamic features, too. This seemingly innocuous bump plays an important role. This is aeronautical engineering epitomized. Every seemingly insignificant design feature has a purpose. Mounting engine intakes along the body of an aircraft comes with some issues that pylon-mounted engines avoid. As air travels along the length of the body, air begins to form a layer of slow-moving turbulent air called a boundary layer, called a boundary layer. If this air is allowed to enter the engine and not only lowers performance, it can also damage the engine. 
As the turbine rotates, it will pass through the slow boundary air on one side and then fast free stream air on the other. This means the force on the turbine blade changes for each and every rotation, causing cyclical bending, a recipe for fatigue failure. Planes like the F-16 feature a boundary layer diverter that separates the inlet from the fuselage with a small gap, but this design increases radar cross-section and increases drag. Later variants of the F-16 tested the DC, a diverterless supersonic inlet, essentially a large bump that creates a region of compression that pushes the boundary layer away from the inlet, while also scattering incoming radar and lowering drag. The test flight demonstrated it could meet performance requirements, ushering its introduction to the F-35. The final product reduces weight by 30s and lowers production and maintenance costs. Moving down the plane, we can see other hints of stealth design. Long, sharp edges are the enemy of stealth. Sharp edges cause radar waves to scatter in all directions. Radar can even travel along the length of a surface in the form of a traveling wave and then scatter upon reaching the trailing edge. The strength of that return signal can be reduced with a few clever techniques. The strength of the signal will depend on the length of the edge, so the first technique is to reduce the edge length with serration. You can see this technique very clearly on the trailing edges of the B-2. However, it's less obvious where it's used for the F-35 until you start looking at all the access hatches hidden around the aircraft. Every single unavoidable surface gap on the aircraft has a serrated edge. This hatch opens to reveal a telescoping ladder to allow pilots to climb in and out of the aircraft. These open to reveal the landing gear. These are the internal weapons bays, essential for keeping the radar reflecting missiles hidden from view, and these smaller hatches are flare dispenser doors. Flares are effective decoys for heat-seeking missiles, but they do nothing to prevent radar-guided missile. In the face of radar-guided missile proliferation and continued growing sophistication in the technology, a new decoy system was developed. This new technology is released from this panel. When needed, this access door opens and a transmitter begins to reel out to a safe distance behind the plane. It has three levels of countermeasures to protect the F-35 from attack. First, it actively jams missiles while they attempt to lock onto their target by emitting jamming signals which the onboard computer computer computes and delivers to the emitter through the fiber optic tower. If the radar manages to obtain a lock, it then begins to attempt to break the lock, disrupting the tracking algorithms guiding the missile towards its target. Finally, if all is lost and the missile is bearing in on the aircraft, the emitter begins to simulate the aircraft's radar signature, drawing the missile towards it as a decoy. These serrated hatches hid critical components of the F-35, but more can be done to reduce edge scattering in these locations. You may notice that the color around these edges is different to the rest of the plane. This is because the edges are treated with a special radar scattering tape. In the same way traveling waves scatter when they meet an edge discontinuity, they will scatter when traveling over a change in conductivity. The F-35 uses this to its advantage to scatter the waves over a longer distance, reducing the return signal by spreading it out. The tape has a conductivity gradient, gradually decreasing its electrical conductivity, causing radar waves to scatter at each interval, slowly decreasing the intensity of the surface wave before it reaches the edge where it would have released one large return if the tape was not present. The surface of the plane itself is composed of specialized radar-absorbing material. In 2010, Lockheed Martin filed this patent for a carbon nanotube-infused composite material that can absorb radar waves from 0.1 MHz through to the 60 GHz. This is an incredibly wide range of frequencies, notably covering the frequencies Russian surface-to-air missiles like the advanced S-400 system uses. The effect traveling surface waves have on stealth design can be seen elsewhere 